All right, great singing. Take your Bibles and go back to Ecclesiastes chapter 11. Ecclesiastes chapter 11. And while you're turning there uh, to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, I'm just going to read to you from Galatians 5, 22 once again, which reads, But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Remember last time I covered this, we, we spoke about love and what it, means to, what it means to love the things that God loves and to hate the things that God hates. But the second one in the list is joy. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Hey, if you've got these qualities about you in your life, if they're fruits that are emulating from the Holy Spirit living in you, then there is no law in the sense that you cannot be breaking God's laws. These are things that are not sinful. These are things that we should be aiming for in order to walk in the Spirit and overcome this sinful flesh that we have. All right? But if you go to Ecclesiastes chapter 11, just look at verse number 8 quickly. Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 8. It says, But if a man live many years and rejoice in them all. The title of the sermon tonight is Rejoice in Them All. Hey, you know what? The Bible says that it is possible to rejoice in every day that we're given. Every day that God gives us is an opportunity for us to rejoice. All right? So I want you to look at verse number 7 to begin with there. Verse number 7, Ecclesiastes chapter 11, verse 7. Let's let's start from there. It says, and look, if if you know the book of Ecclesiastes, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's Solomon basically speaking about, you know, all the riches, all the pleasures, all the possessions, that he has, and he sees it all as vanity. But as you read through that book, you know, as you get toward the end, this is toward the end of the book, you know, he starts to turn uh, a page and he starts to realize what's important in life. And this is pr- probably the point where you start to see things change in his attitude toward life. But look at number, verse number seven there. It says, truly the light is sweet. And the light he's referring to here is the, the light of the sun. And then he says, and a pleasant thing It is for the eyes to behold the sun. And he's saying, what are you talking about? When I look into the sun, it burns my eyes. I can't look at it. Well, what he's talking about here, when you look at the rest of this chapter, is he's talking about sunrise. You know, when when the sun starts to rise, you know, you've got got that beautiful color. You can actually look at the sun. It's not harmful to your eyes in that early stage. You've got that early light. He's saying, hey, that's, that's a beautiful thing to behold. It's a pleasant thing to behold. And what he's comparing there with the rest of the chapter is the days of your youth. You know, it's kind of like when the sun starts to rise. It's kind of like the, the, the start of the day, you know, the, 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 the early morning, and then obviously the, the sun rises and eventually the sun sets. And he compares that to your life and the days of your life, especially the early days of your life. And you look at verse number eight, he says, but if a man lived many years, so this is a man who's obviously lived a long time. You know, he's older, he's an elder. And then it says, and rejoice in them all, right? But then, so he's talking about a man that can live a long life and rejoice in every day of his life, every year of his life. It says, yet let him remember the days of darkness. Say, what are the days of darkness? Well, just like when the sun rises, eventually that sun will set and you'll get into darkness, right? It's nighttime. He's talking about the days once once a man has passed away. You know, it's a, it's a euphemism of kind of saying like the days of death, right? He says, the days, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, yet let him remember the days of darkness, for they shall be many. All that cometh is vanity. So he's comparing, you know, the many years that we, we hopefully get to have, we can rejoice in that, but let us not forget about the days of darkness to come. Because largely speaking, you know, generally speaking, unless you're the last few generations of, of, of Christians on this earth, you're going to spend more time dead, you know, physically dead, I'm speaking, than you were alive. You know, someone that lived 100 years ago, passed away 100 years ago, you know, they, they've spent more days in the days of darkness, as it were, dead than they have lived. All right? So what Solomon is saying here, yes, you can rejoice in all your years, but don't forget, remember the days of darkness. There's coming a time when your days will end. You know, eternity is what matters. Okay, what you do now in this life, yes, rejoice, but eternity matters. Keep that in your mind. Otherwise, it's vanity if you forget that because the few days of life in comparison to eternity is very, very few. The Bible says your life is like a vapor. You know, it's here one moment, gone the next. Let's keep reading verse number nine. 
Rejoice, O young man. Hey, this is, this is a command, right? He, he, God, when He speaks to us, yes, these are words of Solomon, but He's been inspired by the Holy Ghost. You know, God wants us to live a life of joy. It's, it's sort of not worth, like, you know, if you're a person that's lacking joy in your life, it's almost like it's just not worth living. I mean, the, the reason people commit suicide is because they just find no joy in life. And if they can't find joy in life, then what's the purpose of living, you know? And so joy is an important aspect that God wants us to live. It says in verse number 9, Rejoice, O young man, in thy youth, and let thy heart cheer thee in the days of thy youth, and walk in the ways of thine heart and in the sight of thine eyes. But we need to be mindful as we read the rest of this verse here that we rejoice in the right things, that we rejoice in the things that God gives us, rejoice in the things that are godly, that we rejoice in the things that are righteous, because there is another way that this world rejoices. You know, the, the non-believing world, the ungodly world also find joy, but they find joy in wickedness. They find joy in things that are ungodly, unrighteous, right? And so when you look at verse number nine, the, second, the, the last part there says, but know thou that for all these things, God will bring thee into judgment. So be mindful about the things you rejoice in. Right? Because there's coming a day when you're going to stand before God in judgment. We know the non-believers will be judged you know, um, out of the books and they're not, they're not going to measure up. Their name's not going to be found in the book of life and they're going to be cast you know, into the lake of fire. But even as believers, we're going to be judged, obviously, for the works we've done for Christ. And you know, I, I hope the joy that you find in your life, the rejoicing that you have in your life, has been built on the righteousness that we have in the Word of God. Otherwise, those things that you rejoiced in, that were a waste of time, maybe sins that you rejoiced in, you know, when you stand before God in judgment, all of that's just going to burn up and you're not going to be rewarded by your Heavenly Father. So look at verse number 10. Therefore, so because we know we're going to be faced judgment by God, therefore remove sorrow from thy heart and put away evil from thy flesh, for childhood and youth are vanity. So be mindful of your young days. It's good to rejoice. You know, we should try to rejoice in every day that God has given us, but be mindful in what you're rejoicing in, all right? That's, that's just the introduction, okay? So this is fruit of the Spirit part two, okay? Rejoice in them all. And what we saw there, rejoice in all the days that God has given us. But we, there's many things in the Bible that we can rejoice over, all right? Now, uh, go to chapter three, please. Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse four, very quickly. Ecclesiastes chapter three, verse four. Because I just want to compare this from the same book, all right? Just very quickly there, it says, you know, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. When I say, when we speak of the Bible, we say that God wants us to rejoice in the life that He's given us. It's not saying that there's never a time to mourn. It's not saying that there's never a time to weep. You know, God has given us these emotions for a reason. You know, the things that give us great joy, the things that give us great sadness, those emotions have been built in us for a reason. So we can react in the right way for, you know, life situations that come in our way. Okay? So it's not to say if, you, if you're saddened, if you weep, or if you mourn, that you're outside of the will of God. No, because there's a right place for those emotions. But what I'm saying is that as believers, we should be people that are recognized for the joy that we have. It's kind of like when we covered the, the love, the fruit of the Spirit as love. You know, we should be seen, uh, be, be known as people that have a great love. Yes, that's not to say we shouldn't hate the things that God hates. Absolutely. You know, but we shouldn't be people that are known just for hatred. We shouldn't be people that are just known because we're sad and mourning. No. People should look at us and say, hey, this person has love. Hey, this person has joy. Okay? In comparison, you know, to these other things, but they have their proper place. And, you know, it's, it's the same way, like I said, you know, with hatred. We should hate the things that God hates. You know, we should love the things that God loves. And a lot of Christians, they don't understand, you know, how can, these, how can we uh, work toward these two things? You know, but it's easy because it's wrong to love the things that God hates. And it's wrong to hate the things that God loves. Same thing with joy. You know, it, it's right to rejoice, but rejoice in the things that are righteous not the things that are unrighteous, not the things that are vanity, not the things that waste your time in your life, all right? So 
It is possible to find joy in the wrong things. I mean, that's what the world largely wants to do. Now, if you guys can turn to Proverbs chapter 2, please. Proverbs chapter 2. Let's make sure we're finding joy in the right things. All right? Proverbs chapter 2, verse 10. Proverbs chapter 2, verse 10. I want you to notice this. It says here, When wisdom entereth into thine heart, and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. I just want you to notice those four main words there. Verse number 10, wisdom, knowledge, verse 11, discretion, understanding. Why is it important as people of God that we have these qualities in us? It says, to deliver thee from the way of the evil man, from the man that speaketh froward things, who leave the paths of unright, uprightness, uprightness, to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice to do evil. Hey, there is joy in doing evil. Okay, the wicked, the ungodly find joy in evil things, in wicked things, right? And, then, and delight, they delight in the frowardness of the wicked, whose ways are crooked, and they, and they froward in their paths. How do we overcome, you know, the, 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 the kind of joy that is wicked, the joy that's, that's evil, you know, from people that try to drag us into finding joy in wickedness and sin. What do we need in our lives? We saw that in verse 10 and 11. We need wisdom, we need knowledge, we need discretion, we need understanding. And those elements come from God, obviously, because, you know, joy is a fruit of the Spirit. It comes from the Holy Spirit in line with what we read in the Word of God. All right? Now, let me just try to help you understand these four um, uh, concepts or these four, four uh, qualities um, as best as I can. Um, because, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the time you read, might read the Bible, and it might seem like these things are used um, interchangeably. And I think sometimes God does use it interchangeably, okay? But just, I'll just give you the example of, uh, let's say, you know, you're preaching the gospel to someone, okay? You're preaching the gospel to someone, you want to see that person get saved. Well, that person, in order to get saved, they must first have understanding, okay? They must first understand what you're telling them. They have to have the ability to comprehend the information that you're giving them, right? And part of that understanding process is to ask questions, or to seek clarification, okay? That's important in order for you to get saved, so you can, that you understand, right? Then knowledge, what is knowledge? Well, knowledge is the attainment of truths and facts, all right? So once, when you're giving someone the gospel, they need the understanding, okay? Understand what you're saying. And, and once that's occurred, they have now uh, gained the knowledge. They, they've, uh, they've um, you know, um, attained the truth or the facts of the gospel. They've attained that. You know, there are people, and I'm sure you've all experienced this, where you've shared the gospel with them, you go through it, they understand it, they've un they, they get it, right? You ask them questions, they get all the right answers, but they don't want to place their faith on the Lord, okay? So that's where discretion comes in. What is discretion? Discretion is making correct judgment based on the knowledge that you've gained. Making correct judgment, okay, on the knowledge, all right? So, for example, now someone's got the knowledge of salvation. Now they need to make that discretion. They need to make the right uh, judgment. So, does that mean I need to leave my false religion? You know, do I need to leave, you know, my false churches? You know, do I need to stop trusting myself? Am I going to make the right judgment now and say, hey, it's only Jesus Christ that can save me. He's the only way to heaven. And I'm going to make that right judgment call to put my faith on Him. That's discretion. It's making good judgment on the knowledge that you have, all right? And then finally, wisdom, okay? And wisdom would be when that person places their faith on Christ. Wisdom is the exercise of that knowledge by discretion. It's exercising the knowledge that you've gained, you know, in a, in a rightful way. So I've gained the knowledge, I've understood, I've got the knowledge, I make the right judgment call, yes, now I need to believe on Christ. Well, now you need to exercise the knowledge that you've got. You place your faith on Christ. You put your, you know, you believe on Him with all your heart. And that's wisdom. Okay? It's, it's wise to trust Jesus Christ for salvation. And of course, you can take these words and apply it to different situations. Okay? But I just want to show you that knowledge alone is not enough. You also need to be wise. You need to exercise the knowledge that you have. Now, a lot of people uh, spend a lot of time learning doctrine. And they have a lot of knowledge of doctrine. It's all good. 
but they need to exercise that knowledge. They need to, you know, do the things that they see, the commands that they see. You know, they might know how to, what you need to do to raise kids. They have all the knowledge. They see all the scriptures. They've heard a hundred sermons about raising kids. But you've got to put that into practice. That's wisdom. You know, raising your children and nurturing and admission of the Lord. So that's just a quick example I wanted to give you about those words there. Now, I want you to turn to Hebrews chapter 11, please. Hebrews chapter 11, okay? Hebrews chapter 11. Maybe I should have told you the same Proverbs, but it doesn't matter. Go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. So we need the knowledge, the understanding, the wisdom, the discretion, you know, from the Word of God in order for us to make sure we don't find joy in the wrong things, that we don't find joy in wickedness. But look at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 24. This, of course, being about Moses. It says, By faith Moses, when he was come to years refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy, notice this, than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. Did you know there's joy? You can enjoy sin. I mean, the reason you sin is not just because you have a sinful flesh, but when you sin, it gives joy to that sinful flesh. That's why you do it. Okay, if you didn't enjoy it, you wouldn't sin. That's one of the struggles we have in our lives. Okay, and Moses, instead of enjoying his sin, instead of enjoying the pleasure of sin, you know, being worldly, being rich and powerful, you know, in the kingdom of Egypt, you know, the Bible says that the, 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 uh, the joy of the pleasure of sin is but for a season. Okay, it's temporal, it's, it's not long lasting. That's why when you sin, it feels good. But then after a while, you feel bad about it. And it's like the only way you can get that kick once again is to commit that sin once again, whatever that sin is. All right? Notice in verse 26, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of that reward. Hey, Moses had eternal rewards in mind. He had eternity in mind. That's what we saw in Ecclesiastes. Yeah, it's fine to rejoice in your life. But don't forget the days of darkness, which are many, okay? And that's exactly what Moses did. He saw, no, I need to put my mind on eternity, on the things of God. There's greater joy there. There's greater riches there. But I want you to notice there is joy even in sin, okay? So we need to be mindful. What kind of joy do we want in our lives? Sinful joy, joys that fulfill the flesh, or joy that comes from the Holy Spirit, that's fruit of the Spirit. You know, there's reward in that. There's a reward by working out the, the fruits of the Spirit in your life. Now, I'm going to read to you just very quickly from Proverbs 10, 28. It just says, The hope of the righteous shall be gladness. Okay? The hope of the righteous is gladness. We're aiming to be people that are glad, that are rejoicing. And it contrasts, but the expectation of the wicked shall perish. Hey, the things that the hope of the wicked, the things they seek after in life, the joys they seek into in life, it says here, shall perish in contrast to the hope of the righteous, which is eternal life, you know, which is eternal treasures in heaven, the joy that we can only find by knowing God, by knowing His Word and living a life that is pleasing to Him. All right? So be mindful. You may say, I'm, I'm a really happy person. I have a great life. Yeah, but what are you finding joy in? You know, and it's not always black and white. You know, there's, there's going to be times where you find joy in, in, in godly things. And there's going to be parts of your life where you find joy in worldly, temple things that will perish. You know, and uh, that's just because we have that dual nature in us, right? But we want to, we want to try to transfer all that joy onto the things that are, are godly. And you know what? There, there are going to be things that are righteous and godly that you don't find joy in. Okay? You just don't naturally find joy in. And these are things you need to work on. You need to work on the fruit. You need to develop this fruit. Ask God to help you develop uh, a joy for the things that are righteous, the things that are holy. All right? Now, the next point I want to bring to, you, uh, to your attention here is what should we find joy in? What shall we find joy in? Now, I went to my uh, computer software program. I typed in joy. I typed in rejoice. I typed in gladness and glad. I typed in happy. I typed in merry. I typed in... What other words <laughs> kind of go with joy? There's probably a lot of others, right? And I just found hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds of verses touching all these aspects. 
You know, the Bible, if you take it as a whole, is filled with, with gladness and joy. God wants to make our hearts merry. God wants us to enjoy our lives, you know. Um, and, and so I had to narrow it down. I, I just narrowed it down to 10 things, okay? 10 things that we ought to, as just every day of our lives, find joy in. Joy in but this is not an exhaustive list. I mean, I, I, I could make this a series of, you know, five sermons or something if we're just going through everything that God wants us to find joy in. But let me, let me go through a few things uh, with you. Now, I'm going to turn to, let's see, yeah, turn to Psalms. Turn to Psalms 118. Psalms 118. I've got a few references to Psalms, so I'll get you guys to just stay in Psalms for now, and I'll read the other passages to you. But Psalm 118, verse 24. So point number one, what, what does God want us to find joy in? It's kind of what I'd already discussed as an introduction. God wants us to find joy in all the days that God has given us. All the days that God has given us. Okay, look at verse number 24. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Hey, no option. You can't say to me, I'm not going to rejoice today. No, we will rejoice and be glad in it. I say, why? Because this is a day which the Lord hath made. Okay? Every day of your life is a day that God has given you to live for Him. Okay? Every day God has given you to find joy in, in that day. All right? So, you know, God wants us to, to enjoy life. And, you know, one of the misconceptions that uh, non-believers have of, of, of fundamentalist Christians, all right? I, I face this even with my non-believing brother, you know. He, um, he thinks that fundamental, fun, fundamentalist Christians, that we're, we're, we've got no joy. You know, he thinks we're, we're these strict funny daddies, you know, um, who's always angry, you know, who's always... Um, you know, condemning everybody who's never happy. You know, they see all the wickedness of, in the world and it just upsets them and they don't have smiles on their faces. But, you know, a lot of the world does think about that. Like, not, not every Christian, but definitely fundamental Bible-believing Christians. The world thinks of us many times like that. And I think, um, you know, in my life, in the churches that I've been at, I've seen believers that are always depressed. They're always cast down. They're always upset about something. You know, and, and it shouldn't be that way because God wants us to rejoice in the day that He made, you know. And uh, as we saw in Ecclesiastes, you know, rejoice in them all. You know, God has given us these days. And sometimes, you know, you might be going through difficulties, stressful times. You know, you might be going, I just don't want tomorrow to come around because I've, I've still got this problem. It's just another day that I have to face this difficult situation that I'm in. And, you know, you, you might want to just sleep and, not, and, and, not, and hope for the, for the sunrise not to rise. You know what? God's given you that new day for a reason. God's given you that, that new day, you know, every day that you wake up to fix the problems that there are, you know, to find solutions for your, for your trials, you know, an extra day where you can come to the Lord and ask for His help to pray for your every need. You know, uh, we, should, we, we all have trials. We all have difficulties, you know, like all of us, some more than others, you know, some in finances, some in health and some in relationships, some in your workplace, or, you know, we all have trials. The thing is, you know, that's, that's the case. Sometimes as believers, we think, I'm the only one going through problems. You know, no one else is. No, everyone is. Everyone is. Everyone's got a measure of trials and tribulations. But God has given us new days every day so we can try to fix those things, so we can come to Him and ask Him for help, you know, and find joy in His help, find joy in, in pleading to our, to our Heavenly Father. So, Every day, guys, that comes, please, don't be upset. Don't be frustrated. I, can't, I, don't want to have, I don't want to face it tomorrow. No, it's a day that God hath made. Remember, okay? And if, if you're waking up depressed, you don't want to face this day, hey, that's the flesh. That's the flesh, okay? But the spirit, the new man, the fruit of the spirit that, wants, that God wants to develop in you wants you to be rejoicing in the days that God has given you. The next thing, uh, God, you know, point number two, what else can we find joy in? You guys turn to Psalm 113. Psalm 113. But my second point is find joy in your family. Find joy in your family. All right? This is so important. These are the people you're going to spend most of your life with. Okay? If God wants us to rejoice all the days that we have, a lot of those days are going to be spent with your family. A lot of those hours are going to be spent with your family. I'm going to read to you from Proverbs 5.18, which says, 
Let thy fountain be blessed, speaking to men, and rejoice with the wife of thy youth. You know, God wants us to find joy, men, in our wives. Okay, they're wives of our youth. It doesn't say find, you know, uh, rejoice with the, the wife in your youth. Where it's, it's only in your youth where you can rejoice in your wife before you have too many responsibilities, before you have too many children. No, it says rejoice with the wife of thy youth. Meaning that if you're 80 years old and you're, and you're married, that's, that, that woman that you married was the wife of your youth. Rejoice in her even when you're 80 years old. All right? Even once you've had a bunch of kids and they've grown up. You know, it's, it, we're commanded to take that partner, that married partner that we have, and find joy with them. Of course, this passage about, is about the intimate relationship. You can't forget that. That's a very important part of your married life, you know, between husbands and wives. You guys are in Psalms 113. Look at verse number 9. Psalm 113, verse 9. He maketh the barren woman to keep house and to be a joyful mother of children. Praise ye the Lord. You know, God wants every barren woman, all right, to have children. It's, it's God's design for, for married couples to have children, okay? And if you're someone that's barren, you know, I know my wife, when we first got married, you know, she got told she'd never be able to have kids. You know, we considered her barren, you know? But, you know, what a great promise that says here, He maketh the barren woman to keep house. Meaning God's going to make barren women have children. Praise God, you know? But notice, it's not just having children. And be, to be a joyful, a joyful mother of children. Again, what does the world tell you? The world tells you, hey, if you want to zap your joy, get rid of your joy, get married and have kids. Hey, if you want burdens in life, they say, then get married and have kids. You want to be tied down and not be able to do the fun things, the fun activities, your hobbies and whatever it is that you find you know, joy in, then get married and have kids. You know? And uh, a lot of people don't find joy in their children. You know, but God doesn't just make a woman uh, have kids. But if you're with the Lord, if you're fellowshipping with the Lord, if you're working and walking in the Spirit, He's also going to make you a joyful mother. And it's very important for your kids to know that you find joy in them. And, uh, you know, my personal experience with this, and I think all, all men, all, all fathers, all married men have to go through this, is, you know, before you get married, you've got your group of friends, you've got your hobbies, and you've got your the things you spend money on that's a waste of time, whatever, whatever they are, whatever those things are, you know, um, and then you get married. And then it's usually okay because you've got, you know, your married partner there with you, but then you have kids. And then you find as life goes on, you've got less and less time to spend with your friends. You have less and less time to, to you know, do your hobbies and, and, and all your activities and all the kinds of things that you used to find joy in. And I remember, you know, just, you know, this is part of maturity, maturing, part of growing, part of becoming a family man, uh, you know, and, and, you know, seeking the Lord and becoming more like, more righteous like God, where I was getting frustrated in my life. I was getting frustrated that, you know, I'd spend X amount of hours at work, I'd come home, there were responsibilities, you know, there were things to do, and I kind of wanted to see my friends. I wanted to go and, and have fun with them or whatever, you know, and uh, I realized that it's not that I had no joy in my family, it's just my priorities were wrong. You know, and I remember just having to make a conscious decision and saying, well, God, you've given me a wife. You've given me kids. I don't have all this time now that I once used to have. I'm just going to find joy in what you've given me. I'm going to find joy in my family. I'm going to find more joy than I currently have. Uh, you know, so much so that I'm not desiring all the other things that I once used to have, you know. And it's like when I made that conscious decision and asked God to help me. All of a sudden, it's like one day to the next, something clicked in my brain. <laughs> I feel like I matured just, just very suddenly, very, you know. And all of a sudden, it's like from one day to the next, I just found a great love, a great joy for my family. I found great joy of coming home from work and seeing the little children, you know, and hearing the noise and, and playing with them and all those kinds of things. And seeing my wife and knowing, hey, this is the woman that I'm going to spend the rest of my life with. And, and the, the thoughts, the feelings of, of the hobbies and the friends, it all just started to, you know, go away. But I found greater joy in the family than what I had before. You know, but it, it requires you to make that decision. It requires you to ask God to help you, you know, to mature, to grow, to develop a love and joy for the family that He's given you. And uh, I'll just read to you from uh, Proverbs 23, 24. It says, 
the father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. Okay? The father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice. And he that begetteth a wise child shall have joy of him. Hey, Amen. You know what gives us great joy? Wise children. Righteous children. That's what's going to give you joy. All right? You know, um, and um, so it's not just having children that gives you joy. Yes, that will give you joy. But it's raising children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. You know, and it requires work. I've already gone through the series on the family. It requires work to raise godly children, to raise a godly seed. Okay, but when you put a lot of work into it, you put a lot of effort into it, a lot of hours, a lot of tears and, 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 and effort, and when it comes to fruition, there's great joy. Okay, just like any job that you work hard at and you, you have success. And there's great joy in raising children, not just by the mother, but by the fathers also. You know? And if you're lacking joy in your family, then that's a fruit of the Spirit that you need to ask God to help you with. You know, to, to, to not just have the children, but to raise them in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Number three, what else can we be joyful about? Um, you guys are in Psalms, right? So go to Psalm 122. And this is a very common one that we've read a few times before, but Psalm 122. Psalm 122 and verse 1. Okay, we should find joy in church attendance. All right? <laughs> I'm glad there was that amen, right? Because... You know, I, I know in a midweek service, it's tiring. You know, you've been at work all day. You probably just want to come home, lift up your feet and relax. You know, and, and the kids, they've been doing schoolwork or whatever. They probably just want to go home and, and play with toys and play whatever, whatever it is they want, you know. But look, there, there's, there's joy in church attendance. It says there in Psalm 122 verse 1, I was glad when they said unto me, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. And of course, in the Old Testament, that was a temple, but the house of the Lord in the New Testament is church. Do you have joy? I mean, do you have joy in church right now? Can you honestly say to me, I'm just, I'm happy to be here. You know, it, it might have been hard to get here, but I'm happy to be here anyway. You know, and I've said this before that the flesh doesn't really want to be in church. The flesh doesn't really want to sing hymns, doesn't really want to uh, hear preaching. Okay. But that new man does. The new man loves it. All right, and I, I compare it to soul winning. You're going soul winning, the flesh doesn't want to do it, but when you're out there doing it, it feels good. You know, the new man's getting fed, the new man's, you know, trying to reproduce, you know, uh, begetting other children of the Lord. And so, you know, there's great joy to be in church, but you know, it's not just about, you know, coming to church, but when you're in church, if you find that there's a lack of joy, I, I, it's probably because your mind is elsewhere. Okay, and I've been there. I've been, like, it's harder now because I'm the I'm usually preaching, so my mind can't really go elsewhere. But I've been there in church where you sit down, you're listening to a sermon, and then you're like, what are we going to have for lunch? You know, <laughs> or, or, you know, was somebody coming over later on today? Or, you know, oh, actually, I've got to go to work on Monday. I've got to finish that project off. You know, but when you come to church, please, don't just come physically. Come mentally. Come mentally prepared. Come spiritually prepared in order to receive the Word of God, to be fed by the Word of God, a place to come to, to rejoice and praise God with fellow brethren. Okay? So yeah, being here is one thing, but make sure you're mentally here, please. And if you find yourself, your mind just wandering off, you've got to get that, imagine that, that vain imagination, that thought, and just bring it back into the, cap, you know, um, to bring it into captive, you know, uh, in, in the name of Jesus Christ. So, you know, please be here mentally as well. You know, you're going to find joy in church attendance when you do that. And you know, for the, for the children, go to the toilet before the service. You know, go to the toilet after the service. So you don't have to get up and then miss part of the sermon. You come back and you're not sure, what are we talking about again? What are we up to, okay? Try to find joy in being here in the house of God. Uh, and then point number four, I'll just read to you very quickly. Um, 2 John uh, 12, it says, Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and, and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. So it's not just coming to church, but number four, we can find joy in fellowship with the brethren. Okay, we ought to find joy in fellowship with the brethren. We have our John here speaking about coming to, to see the church, coming to see fellow brethren. When he, sees, when he can see them face to face, he says our joy may be full. What a, what a great thing. You know, I, I, love, I love having our technology today where we can send text messages, you know, just randomly throughout the day. 
And, and that's happy, you know, you can keep in contact with believers and things like that. It's great, you know, it's good to have technology. But your joy will not be full until you're with them face to face. When you can be amongst the brethren and speak to them. You, please don't replace internet, you know, uh, relationships with real life friendships and relationships from church. Okay? And if you say, look, I just don't have any friends in church. Well, you're, if, if that's the case, you're missing out on a, on, a, on a big joy, you know, a significant joy that you can have in your life. You've got to work toward that. You know, you've got to work to, toward that and, and try to be a blessing to other people. One of the best ways to make friends is just to, you know, stop thinking selfishly. Stop thinking, I'm coming to church. I'm not getting anything out of this. No, you should be thinking, what can I give to other people? How can I serve others? How can I be a blessing to others? And if you do that, I guarantee you, you'll make friends. You know, you'll make friends in church. Um, can you please turn to James chapter 1? James chapter 1. I'll try to be mindful of the time. What time is it? Uh, all right. I'll, I'll get through all 10 points. I'll just be, I'll go, I'll go through the next five quickly. But uh, James chapter 1 verse 2. Now, there is a time to mourn. There is a time to weep. We know that. All right. But even when things are going bad, God wants us to find joy as well, all right? So in James chapter 1, just verse 2 there, it says, My brethren, count it all joy. Wow, when I'm blessed, when I'm prosperous, is that when I find joy? <laughs> well, amen, yeah, but what does this say? <laughs> count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, all right? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith work of patience. Now, patience is another fruit of the Spirit. Now, one thing that I, that I noticed as I'm going through and preparing sermons on the fruit of the Spirit, there's a lot of overlap. You know, I, you can't really help it. Because, I mean, you can't really have love unless you have, find joy in the things that you love. You can't really have joy unless you have peace, you know, within yourself to, to, to express that joy. So a lot of the fruits of the Spirit, there is this overlap that you'll find. And we see an overlap here with joy and, and patience there. Uh, but it says in verse number four, But let patience have a perfect work that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. To be perfect is to be complete, to be mature. You know, God allows trials and temptations in our lives, not because He hates us. He allows it so we can grow from it, so we can develop. You know, um, Brother Callum goes to the gym. I'm sure you didn't start lifting the weights you lift right now. You know, you, you needed a bit of trial, a bit of, you know, a bit of difficulty, you know, a certain weight. Once you, ha you mastered that weight, you moved up to, a, to something harder. And then you build, you build and build. But it hurts. It hurts the body, right? And that's the same as temptations and trials and difficulties in life. You know, it, it hurts. But it helps you grow. It helps you become stronger. It helps you call out to God, be closer to Him. Many times God just allows problems in our lives because we've, we've, we've distanced ourselves from God. We haven't picked up our Bibles. We haven't been praying to Him. And He's got to put us through some difficulty so we just call out, you know, in faith. Say, God, help me, you know? But that's going to help us to mature, to grow, to develop. That's why it's a, uh, it says here, you know, count it all joy when you fall into temptation, the difficulties, the trials of your life. But look at verse number five. Remember how wisdom was important, understanding, knowledge, in order to find joy in the right things, all right? Because look at verse number five. It says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, Look, God wants to give you all the wisdom. You just have to ask Him. And, uh, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given Him. So the way we find joy in our trials and difficulties is to first seek wisdom from God. If you don't understand, how do I overcome this trial? How do I overcome this temptation? You need to go to God, and He's going to give it to you. He's going to explain to you why you're going through this difficulty. He's going to show you how to get through this difficulty. And it's going to uh, allow you to mature and grow, become complete through the perfect word, work of God. So please, you know, you may mourn, you may weep for a little while when you go through difficulties, but find the joy because God has allowed you to go through something to grow, to, to develop in. Okay? Number six, uh, I'll just read to you from Proverbs 15 verse 23. But try to find joy. This is going to sound weird, but I thought it was an interesting one. Find joy in your own wise words. Joy in your own wise words. I'll read to you from Proverbs 15, verse 23. It says, A man hath joy by the answer of his mouth, and a word spoken in due season 
How good is it? All right? So what it's talking about here is, you know, having knowledge, having wisdom, having good words that you can speak to another person, to edify that person, to give them counsel. You know, they're in a, they're in a tough place. They don't know what decisions to make. Speaking good words that encourages them, gives them direction. The Bible says here is that you're going to find joy in the answer of your mouth. But of course, the answer of your mouth has to be with wisdom, has to be with understanding, has to be with knowledge, has to be grounded in the Word of God. Because there's a lot of people that speak foolish things as well. All right? But you can find joy in your own words. All right? Not because, you know, not, not to fill yourself with pride, but knowing that your words can help other people. There's joy in that. You know, there's joy in helping others, giving uh, so there, a, a word spoken in due season at the right time, perfect timing. Your words, you know, uh, help someone along the way. Number seven, you can find joy in God's chastisement. Joy in God's chastisement. I'll get you guys to turn to the book of Ecclesiastes just so while I, while I, I read this to you. But if you turn back to Ecclesiastes, please. But we can find joy in God's chastisement. I'm going to read to you from Psalm 30, verse 4, while you turn to Ecclesiastes. Psalm 30, verse 4, it says, Sing unto the Lord. Now, when we sing praises to God, that's really us rejoicing in the Lord. That's what You're going to find joy in singing. But I'm not going to talk about singing all that much here. But I just want to show you there. Sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of His, and give thanks at the remembrance of His holiness. Now, notice this. It says, for his anger endureth but a moment. This is the anger of God. It endureth for a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And I like the parallel there with you know, the joy of the, uh, you know, the, the sunrise, kind of what we saw in the book of Ecclesiastes there. But it says joy cometh in the morning. Okay, what is that about? Okay, let me just read it again, verse number five, slowly. It says, for his anger endureth but a moment. You know... You, if you haven't gone through the chastisement of God, one day you will, all right? And, one, and, and sometimes, the first time you go through it, you can be really stubborn and go, oh man, this is persecution. <laughs> the devil's after me and I'm suffering for the name of Christ. And then after a time, it's, hold on, I think this is God chastising me. <laughs> I think I've done wrong. I think, you know, God's, you know, taking down my pride and, and things like that. But anyway, you know, when God chastises us, sometimes, it's, many times it's out of anger. You know, his children are disobedient. We know he's long-suffering. We know he's slow to anger. But there comes a time where he goes, you know what, I have to chastise you. You know, and, and, he, and he, he's, you know, he does it out of anger. It's fine. You know, anger is an emotion that God has and we ought to have as well. Otherwise, we won't react in the right way. And then it says, in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night. Yeah, after you get chastised, you may weep for a night. You know, there's a, there's a time where you're going to weep, but joy cometh in the morning. Hey, once you've gone through the chastisement, once you've learned the lesson, once you're like, oh man, God, you know, <laughs> I need to fix this up, I need to do better, then there's joy in that, okay? So you may, not, you may not feel very pleasant, you may not really find joy while you're getting chastised, but the product of that is joy, all right? And uh, obviously as a father, you know, I've experienced this many, many times, where you have to take your child, you have to discipline them, you have to correct them with the rod, they don't find it pleasant at that moment, all right? But once it's done, they say, sorry, you forgive them, you put it behind them. The children are happy. You know, children generally are happy. It's like they were waiting for that discipline. So they can just move on now. They can put that chapter behind them, put that mistake behind them, and then they're happy, joyful children. Right? And if you say to me, but maybe this is beyond the scope of this sermon, but you know, I chastise my kids, but they're still frustrated, they're still angry, then you haven't done the chastisement correctly. It may not have been hard enough. You may not have told them why they're being chastised. You know, they might be getting mixed messages. You know, maybe mom said this, dad said that. You know, moms and dad, you have to be on the same page. Otherwise, your kids will be confused. What's right and wrong? So, you know, chastisement is not just taking out the, the rod and, 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 uh, and uh, giving corporal punishment, but it's also training, it's discipline. You know, um, setting rules, setting boundaries so children know, you know, what is right and wrong. And uh, if you have all that stuff in place, once you do the chastisement, your children should be happy once it's done, once it's finished. They know dad, mom and dad have forgiven me, it's behind us, we can move on, you know. And I usually just try to, you know, make them happy. I usually try to make them laugh or something after the chastisement so they know there's no hard feelings, you know, there's no grudge. Anyway, there's, there's joy in God's chastisement. I've got three more things. 
Uh, you guys are in Ecclesiastes, look at verse number 5, uh, chapter 5, sorry, chapter 5, chapter 5, verse 18. Ecclesiastes, chapter 5, verse 18. I'll just go through these last ones very quickly. Find joy in your possessions. Joy in the things that God has given you, all right? That could be your, obviously, family would be within that. But also, you know, your house, your car, your clothing, your, your finances, the things that God has given you, it's good to find joy in your possessions. Look at Ecclesiastes 5, verse 18. It says, Behold, that which I have seen, it is good and comely for one to eat and to drink, and to enjoy the good of all his labor that he taketh under the sun all the days of his life, which God giveth him. For it is his portion. Hey guys, the things you have in life, God has given that to you. It's your portion of life. Find joy in the things that God has given you. I'm not saying like find joy in material wealth, in gain material wealth. I'm saying in the things that you, the things that you currently have, find joy. You know, don't be looking at others and looking at the possessions that others have and the riches that others have. Whatever it is that others have and be like, I wish I was like them. Now find joy in what God has given you. There's joy there, okay? And you, and you won't be designed. When you find joy in what God has given you, when you understand, hey, this is my portion in life. This is what God has given me. He's given me this for a reason. Then you're not going to be desiring. You're not going to become covetous. You're not going to love, you know, have the love for, uh, you know, of money in your life you know, and, and seeking things that don't belong to you. So find joy in your possessions. But look at verse number 19, and this is point number 9. Find joy in your labor, okay, which is the vessel of where your possessions come from. Okay, but look at verse number 19. It says, Every man also to whom God hath given riches and wealth and hath given him power to eat thereof and to take his portion and to rejoice in his labor. This is the gift of God. This is the gift of God. You know, we, we love talking about salvation, you know, uh, as the gift of God. But you know, your wealth, but even your job, which is the vessel to, to um, have your, you know, your wealth and possessions, the Bible says there it's a gift of God. And He wants you to rejoice in your workplace. Say, I don't rejoice in my workplace. I don't want to go to work tomorrow, whatever it is. I find joy in the work that God's given you. You know, right now for me, this church is my workplace. You know, being a pastor now is my job. You know, even, even uh, down in Sydney. You know, and, and let me just say this. It's a lot easier to find joy, you know, in, in, in being amongst the brethren, you know, the people of God and, and preaching His Word than it is doing your secular job. But even in your secular job, God wants you to rejoice. Find joy in it. God's given it to you. It's His gift. It's His gift to you. And I think if you have the right perspective on, on work, on laboring, on a job, and you know, this is God's gift to me, then you're going to find joy in it. You know, it's about having the right perspective in life. And the last thing I want to talk about, this is probably the most important one. I'll get you guys to turn to... Uh, Philippians. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Like I said, this is not an exhaustive list, you know, but I hope this makes you think. If there's, if there's some of these things that I've mentioned that you're not finding joy in, I hope you, you, you know, you, tonight you, you, you go to the Lord and ask the Lord, Lord, help me find joy in these things that I'm lacking in, you know. Help me look at, find other passages in the Bible of where you want me to have joy in my life, where you want this fruit of the Spirit to develop in my life. And if I'm lacking in that area, please help me to develop joy in that area. So the last thing I want you to look at, you guys, you guys are turning to Philippians chapter 3. And uh, I'm going to read to you from Habakkuk 3.18. Habakkuk 3.18. It says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The last place, made the most important place, that you should be finding joy in is in the God of your salvation. Okay, the God of the Bible, the God that's redeemed you. All right, look at Philippians 3, verse 1. It says, Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. Okay, to write the same things to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the concision. And by the way, when you talk about the dogs and, and evil workers, you know, the Jews here, people that are, you know, trying to turn you away from, from Jesus as the Son of God or whatever, you know, it could get you down. It could get you discouraged knowing that you're in a spiritual warfare, okay? But look at verse, three, uh, verse number 3. For we are the circumcision which we uh, worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. 
you know, even in spiritual warfare, even when there's heresies, you know, uh, when people are teaching falsehoods, when they're misguiding you, the instruction, even in that spiritual warfare, is to find joy. Okay? And when you're struggling to find joy anywhere else, the best place to go and find that joy is in the God of our salvation. To find joy in God, to find joy here in Christ Jesus. Okay? So how do I find joy in Him? You know, I have joy of salvation. That's good. You know, it's good to, to know you're saved. You're going to spend eternity in heaven. But you really need to have that relationship, that fellowship with God. To be walking with the Lord. The only way you can do that is by walking in the Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit is God. Okay? By doing all the things we know, church, praying, reading your Bible. You know, I don't want to go through all those basic things. But all of that, obviously, is your fellowship with God. Okay? Find joy in the God who loves you. Find joy in the God who sent His only begotten Son to die on the cross for your sins. God, I mean, to think that the God of the universe, the creator of all things, the one that can destroy you right now if you really wanted to, has love for you, has a plan for your life, wants you to walk in holiness, wants you to earn rewards in heaven, when you know that same God loves you, you know, you need to find joy in that. If you can't find joy in the God of your salvation, all hope is lost for you. I mean, honestly, I mean, you might struggle because, you, you know, you're going through the hardships. You know, if God loved me, He wouldn't allow me. Hey, no, but God does that. We already saw that. He get, goes, allows you to go through the trials so you can grow in love, so you can rejoice in the trials that God has given you. He's doing it for your own good, you know. And um, you guys can uh, actually go to Philippians 4, Philippians 4.4. 4. Philippians 4.4, 4, just a chapter over. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice, just in case you didn't understand the first time. <laughs> and again, I say rejoice. Okay, we can always, we can always rejoice in the Lord. It's, he's always there. There's always someone, a refuge we can turn to, someone we can speak to at any point in our lives. You know, you, who knows, one day you might be arrested, you know, thrown into solitary confinement. Who knows what kind of persecution may come in your way. No matter where you are, the Lord will never leave you nor forsake you. He's always there. He's always there to give you the joy, okay, that can be found in Him. And I'm just going to finish off with Psalm 16, verse 11. It says, That will show me the path of life. In thy presence, in thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. Hey, you want pleasures forevermore? I think we all want that. It's available at His right hand, but it's in His presence. Okay? You can't think as a believer that you can just turn your back on God. And you just be like, God, you know, I'm coming to church. I'm just going to close my Bible. You know, I, I get enough Bible preaching from church. I don't need to really re read my Bible. You know, Lord, you know my, my needs. I'm not going to pray to you, Lord. Lord, you know, I'm a, uh, you know I'm a sinful person. I'm not going to confess my sins to you. You can't. The, the, the joy of finding that in God is in His presence. His pleasures that He wants to give you, the pleasures of living a godly uh, Christian life are available at His right hand. But you've got to be there with Him. Okay? And if you're saying, I haven't walked with the Lord in a long time, then you're going to start finding yourself missing out on the joy that you once had. Or you're going to try to replace that joy with the joy in this world, like we saw, which, which perishes, that is temporal. You know, that will lead you to sin. You know, this joy in sin for a season. So, you know, joy. You know, the second fruit of the Spirit that we see there, if you're lacking it in your life, then you need to go to the Lord. You need to go ask God, please help the Holy Spirit to develop this fruit in my life. All right? Let's pray.